Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction to Cassandra um, and the work that Cassandra does, and then I will hand it off uh, to our guest speaker. So Cassandra is a certified life and leadership coach who's helped over 5,000 people make the change they want to see in their lives and their community. With over a decade of experience working as an entrepreneur, running a half a million dollar nonprofit and multiple businesses, Cassandra helps aspiring leaders drive social and environmental change. She helps people start, manage, and grow their business or nonprofit in alignment with their values for people, planet, and prosperity. And like many of our speakers in this series, Cassandra is also one of our um, wonderful Evergreen alum. So Cassandra, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, hello, all of you. It uh, looks like we have 19 people on the call. I am very excited for the opportunity to speak with you today. As she mentioned, um, I'm passionate about, um, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm really passionate about driving sustainable, regenerative community development. And so it was so exciting to me whenever I was given the opportunity to speak to you all, because I thought, wow, oh, I, I'm just so in alignment with the things that you were studying and learning along the way. Um, and so uh, it's an honor to be here today and to be able to um, share with you all. So I'm going to start off sharing a little bit about my journey uh, as an Evergreen student and uh, becoming an Evergreen student and then uh, my journey through school, and then how that's led to where I'm at today. And then I will be very excited to dive deep into the subject of how to birth your vision, how to drive collective change through entrepreneurship, um, and we'll be really defining um, what that looks like, and I'll be leaving you with some really tangible tools and resources along the way. Um, expect this to be um, a bit of talking at first, but then lots of engagement along the way. Um, be ready to type in the chat at times or even to unmute and speak up at times. Uh, so without further ado, I will get started um, by presenting my very silly uh, college graduation photos. Um, something that I love about um, being a part of Evergreen and getting to go to this particular college was the encouragement to be yourself and to create your own path, um, including even at your college graduation where you could wear what you'd like. So I chose uh, to tie dye my high school graduation gown and uh, that's what I wore. And in the bottom right corner, that's um, me on the very, on the base doing acro yoga with my friend. And um, so my time at Evergreen was uh, very enlivening and gave me the ability to really um, create my path and a lot of what I experienced during my time at Evergreen and the things that I learned um, have been incredibly instrumental in my post-college life and in all that I've experienced since. Uh, but before I go into my time at Evergreen, starting just a little bit before Evergreen, I was blessed to uh, become an entrepreneur as a high school student. And I had a guest speaker come to my class and um, uh, he uh, came to my Pacific Northwest history class in ninth grade and drew three circles on the board. And those three circles changed my life forever. And a little bit down the line, we'll get into what those three circles are, but I'm sure some of you can guess. And the guest speaker invited students who wanted to become leaders to become change makers in their community to join his leadership team. Um, and so here I am as a sophomore in this picture with my crazy braided hair, uh, presenting to a crowd of 200 people about uh, sustainability issues across my local community, um, King County in particular, up by Seattle, where I spent my teen years. And um, I spent a couple of years uh, developing what we called the watershed report. So we were really studying our different watersheds. This is me presenting um, using a samurai sword to name all the different rivers in my watershed as a way of uh, bringing awareness to water quality issues in my community. And yet, um, he and yet, uh, 
you know, we were having a lot of success. And then all of a sudden there was a linchpin in the system. And I share this because in entrepreneurship, the path is so, um, is not always streamlined. It's not any time in life, but especially in entrepreneurship. And we received an $80,000 grant to advance um, water quality issues in my community. And uh, that grant went into the nonprofit that we were working with that our program was under and they were mismanaging their funds. And all of a sudden that money just disappeared and they were starting to shut down our program. And so that downturn became an opportunity for me because my mentor, my leadership coach decided he needed to start his own nonprofit, $80,000 in the negative. <laughs> um, uh, but that's because he believed so much in the vision and the mission. And it became my opportunity to become a co-founder of that organization. And so I started Sustainability Ambassadors, um, which is a nonprofit uh, really focused on empowering youth to be to catalyze community sustainability, as well as focused on how do we reform education as a whole? So it's more problem-based, it's more hands-on, it's more real world learning. And so of course, running a nonprofit like this, that's really focused on that type of interdisciplinary education of driving that in school, I couldn't go to just any old college. I really needed to go to one that had that foundation of real world interdisciplinary learning. And that's how I found Evergreen. And then of course, it was the beautiful waters that, uh, uh, the beautiful forest and the beautiful waters that drew me in to really decide to call Evergreen home. And um, within the first few weeks, I really found like, yes, this is the campus for me. Um, I started bonding and making friendships, people that I work with to this day. Um, and uh, my love of tie-dye was embodied. Uh, I uh, wore tie-dye during multiple, during that first week, multiple times, apparently. And uh, Evergreen seemed to notice. I was featured on the website, not once, but twice uh, within my first two weeks um, of being on the campus. And I think that just goes to show how much Evergreen loves their tie-dye too. Um, and, uh, how at home I felt here, but it wasn't just because I was featured on the website, it was because of the opportunities to really create my own path in education. So I spent my first year at Evergreen because I came as a junior, so I only had two more years to go. I spent my first year really diving deep into sustainable systems, energy systems. How do you create um, solar systems that produce enough energy? How do you track that? How do you measure that? Going deep into the science of that as well as studying ecological agriculture and how do we build our agricultural systems in alignment with this. Uh, my major was really sustainable systems as a whole and sustainable business. Um, and so I would love to hear from some of you in the, in the chat. Um, what is your area of emphasis? If you know it, if you don't, you can put, I don't know as well, or you can put a few areas that you're exploring. But uh, in your time here at Evergreen, what do you see yourself as kind of focusing on or majoring in, as they would say at other schools? So we'd love to see some activity in the chat. What's your area of emphasis? We have film and audio production, awesome. Psychology and restorative justice. Oh, that's a great combination. Computer science, liberation education in a prison setting and after release. Nonprofit work, communication, journalism, mind, body, healing, systemic change. Christina, you're gonna love what we're talking about today. Um, you as well, Heather, and I'm sure all of you. Um, and feel free to continue to share them, but that's all I'll read out loud. Um, so I love that we have such a varied group here, um, of people who are really passionate about sustainability meets business, sustainability meets telling stories. Um, and that's really what my second year of college got to, I got to be about in a lot of ways. Um, and so and I ended up doing it abroad. And at Evergreen, you can really um, 
through individual learning contracts and internship learning contracts have this ability to, and then through amazing programs like this, to pave your path based on where you know you want to go. And um, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I really wanted to be driving sustainable systems change. I was already doing it in a nonprofit and I just wanted my education to support me in that. And so I spent my last year um, uh, first traveling to Peru. My, my first quarter of my senior year, I did an internship learning contract with a yoga teacher training organization. And I traveled to the Sacred Valley of Peru, which you see here in this uh, picture. Um, and I um, collaborated with this business us uh, doing, I was doing yoga in these sacred mountains, but I was, in terms of my studies, I was really looking at um, uh, how did this organization, this yoga teacher training organization, how were they practicing um, sustainable organizational development? What were they doing to um, align their economic needs with um, environmental issues in the area and with their social purpose? Um, and one great example of that is how they were building their infrastructure. So this particular yoga studio that we're in, you can see the walls are, um, they're clay-based walls. So they were using local materials. The, the hay at the top, um, that forms part of the roof was also all local, um, and, um, creating more economic opportunity with the people that lived in the villages there by building their center. And so I was studying their model of that. And then um, I got the opportunity to um, continue on with them to India. And so a month in Peru and then traveled a month in India. Um, and Christina, you mentioned you're studying business, marketing, event management. Well, that was the other aspect of my studies with them was studying how they were doing international event planning. And so how they were coordinating this event, bringing people together from all across the world to do a yoga tour through these different um, cities that were sacred to the yogic texts. And um, so here we are um, in Rishikesh uh, along the Ganges River, um, practicing, studying not only the yogic practices and how to heal our mind and body, but also studying um, issues around water pollution in the community and around waste. Um, there was a lot of beautiful things that I experienced in India and the culture is amazing, um, but there's also a lot of shadow sides. Some of the most intense poverty I've ever seen, um, roads just lined and lined with trash. Um, and some of the locals, they were just throwing their trash out the window, which happens here too, but it was, it was even more intense there than I had ever experienced. Um, and so while we were traveling to different ashrams um, through different parts of India, um, I began learning about how there was a collective of these spiritual organizations and spiritual groups that were trying to come together and use the common ground of their spirituality to create a collective change around water pollution and around waste. And, um, and so I began to really see uh, more ways that collective impact was happening across the world to make these changes that we wish to see. Um, and I also got to experience the culture, for example, eating with our hands, no forks or knives, just, um, you know, dipping the rice in the curry and eating it right off. It was um, definitely a different way of eating. And we had so much fun doing that. Um, my partner and I, uh, who I was studying with, that the next quarter we decided to do another study abroad program. Um, the hard part about this was I had just barely saved up enough money to do my first travels. Um, so I showed up in Laos for this permaculture design course for our next quarter. And uh, I only had $15 to my name. And I was waiting for my paycheck to come in from my uh, working with my nonprofit. Uh, so I really had to scrape by to make this educational experience happen. Um, but it was empowering nonetheless. And what I was studying this quarter was um, natural building and the science of different natural building materials. And so here I was in Laos on this permaculture farm studying um, natural building in the context of permaculture. So in relation to how you design with the landscape um, and how you design a building um, 
with the sun and and um, with the the different directions so that you can reduce the impact of the building itself, as well as how to build buildings with natural building materials, how to set up compost, as you can see here. Um, how to manage our waste, how to turn our waste not just into this byproduct that we have to figure out how to get rid of, but how to turn it into something that's used. And they actually used uh, biogas from their toilets to uh, help power the kitchen stove. Um, and, uh, and in that way, the waste became a resource. Um, and that's a really big part of um, regenerative sustainability in general is how can we turn these things that are wastes into a resource. Um, and then um, from Laos, we went to Thailand and got to learn with women from all across the world uh, how to build um, using clay, uh, uh, clay as a building material. And um, we were here, we were building a retreat center that was designed for people who were doing social justice um, work in the city nearby so that they had a place to go to relax. And so those of you who are really passionate about social justice and making these big changes, um, I wanna pass on some advice that the, the teachers during this build project shared. And they said that um, people who are making, um, or we're trying to drive this big collective change, we're trying to drive big systems, need small projects that get that feel like success because every day, um, striving, you, you're going to only see microcosms of success because you're trying to shift big systems. So you need tangible hands-on projects like this to really help um, help uh, create some empowerment um, some empowerment around it. And so we got to play in the mud, um, literally play in the mud. We were mixing the straw and the clay with our feet, um, and and then getting to paste the mud onto the walls um, and to help build this infrastructure and learn about green building design. Um, and all the meanwhile, I'm doing research um, to complete my studies about the composition of different natural building materials and, and how they compare in terms of strengths compared to typical building materials like concrete and steel and which natural building materials were the strongest um, and bamboo, which they were using for this roof was one of the strongest natural building materials that we found, which was quite fascinating. Um, and so all of this is to say, is not just to say, hey, look at this amazing education that I got, but this is to say, look at what is possible um, for you and your educational experience. And not that you need to study abroad, although if you get the opportunity, that's awesome, I highly recommend, but not that you need to study abroad to make the change that you want to see. In fact, all of these travels, one of my biggest lessons was that where I could make the greatest impact was back at my home, was back here in the US. Um, and there's so much that you could, so many experiences that you can do. So my biggest takeaway for you is that, um, is that you find ways to, if you want to create these changes, these things, if you want to impact food justice, if you want to um, work on trauma healing and somatic embodiment is to get out into the community, find places where people are already doing this work and really plug in in the best way you can. And so once I graduated from Green, I continued working with Sustainability Ambassadors, the organization that I had created. And after a few years of that, I realized that um, this work was amazing and I loved it. And I kept meeting so many other passionate young entrepreneurs like yourself who really wanted to create their own vision. And so I, um, I decided to start my own business, to step back from the nonprofit, although I still consult with them at times, um, and to start my own business, helping other people birth their vision, hence the title of this talk today. Um, helping other people start, manage, and grow what they feel is their sole purpose or is their mission in life, the change that they want to make. So I'm very passionate about the subject that we have today because I literally created a whole business around it. And I'm so lucky to uh, be doing this work alongside my best friend, Delaney, who is also an Evergreen graduate. Um, and she really, her focus on her skill set is on marketing and wellness. She loves working with wellness businesses and really helping them um, to grow their vision, grow their work. Um, and she tags up 
with me to help um, the businesses that we work and nonprofits that we work with. Um, and so some of the friendships that you're developing today in college can become lifelong friendships that um, continue with you beyond today um, and beyond this time. Uh, so I encourage you to nurture them and appreciate them along the way. And the best part about, one, besides getting to make the amazing impact, the other best part about this work is that it allows me to work from home with my two sweet little babies. So I'm a mama of two. And part of the reason I started my business was not just because I met all these amazing entrepreneurs that I wanted to help, but also because I started to realize, oh, I want to be a mom and I want to figure out a way to make the impact that I want to see and to be able to be home with my babies. And so much of my work is virtual and really allows me to uh, spend time with my babies. Here they, here they are interrupting my, my workflow. <laughs> um, especially my toddler always trying to take over my computer and she's the one in the middle Safira a year and a half old and then Tanis on the far right who is four months old and uh, um, I'm just so blessed um, to have gotten to create a business that allows has allowed me flexibility through motherhood and allows me to make an impact and so I I hold that vision for each of you, um, but wanting you to know that it's not a straight line, that you may hear my story and think it's on the left. It's just, it's that left side, what people are expecting that success should be. Um, and I just want you to know that it's, it's not, it's not a straight line. My journey has been nothing but a straight, nothing but that chaotic mess on the right. Um, and when I share my story, you know, you might see the beginning and the end, um, but there's so much in between that is taken to make it happen. And there's so many ups and downs. And um, that being an entrepreneur isn't always like you start your business or you're a nonprofit or you jump into that work and it's a success. It can take dedication and consistency through the hard times. Um, and just wanting to not to intimidate in any way, but to give you that resilience, that knowing that even when it's hard, it's okay, it's supposed to be, um, especially when you're doing big systems change work. So diving deeper into the topic today, birth your vision, driving collective change through entrepreneurship. We're gonna spend, um, I'm gonna flash through a lot of different slides and images and, um, kind of graphics to really help outline the problem. And some of this, I expect that you all already know if you've driven deep enough into sustainability, but I just wanna make sure that we have some shared consciousness around what is the problem when we're talking about collective change, what is that problem and really problems that we're facing? What's the solution that we're leaning towards? And then I wanna give you some hands-on tools that you can utilize and take with you today. So make sure, especially when I get to the tools, that you take notes, that you write them down. Um, and those are three scales of collective change, the four skills of driving collective change, and the five principles. And then I, for those of you who do want to create your own vision, um, whether it's your own business or your own nonprofit, um, or it's your own initiative, organizations, uh, five steps to birth your vision. So starting with the problem, deforestation, environmental destruction, and not on small scales, but on massive scales across the earth, especially traveling uh, to other countries. I saw how much these issues are not isolated to our communities, but they're happening in various places all across the world. Um, and that many of our challenges that we face in different uh, cultures and communities are very similar. Um, and then, and then poverty, growing poverty, I saw some of the most intense poverty I've ever experienced in India. Um, but then if we bring it home to like here, we're in, in many of our big cities, we're seeing more and more tent cities pop up more and more people that are homeless. This issue is growing every single year. And the challenge of affordable housing is increasing immensely. And then rising costs is making it even more challenging. And um, this is a very real issue for many people. Um, and then we see wars happening and destruction and um, the sudden bombing of Israel recently, the, the possibilities of, of 
every little conflict seeming like it could be the edge of World War III and what that could mean, especially when we have massive technology like nuclear technology. We have some really big issues. How do you even begin to tackle these issues? Um, and it's by first kind of really trying to understand the problem in depth. And we have this one planet and if all 7 billion people on this planet consumed at the rate of a typical European, it would take three planets to support us. So the practices are not sustainable. If all 7 billion people consumed at the rate of a typical American, um, it would take five planets to sustain us. And so we really have to take a look at how we are living. What's the bottom line of all of this? Why, why, why has it become this way? And what I feel and, and a lot of people feel that this is the bottom line, gross domestic product. It's one of the ways that we measure our success as a culture. And um, you'll see the different years on the bottom kind of by quarter from 2013 to 2023. And then you'll see our gross domestic product in the trillions um, going up. You'll see a big dip in 2020 um, whenever we had the pandemic. And then it just continued to rise again. And so we're seeing this, this kind of endless growth in terms of economic development. And that's supposedly the measure of our well-being. And in some ways, it does measure our well-being because sometimes it measures our improvement around quality of life because those numbers are based on resource extraction. Um, are we getting more resources that we need? Transportation, are we moving across the landscape in the ways that we need to? Manufacturing, are we producing what we need? Are we packaging, distributing it, marketing it, consuming it? And there's some aspects of this, there's some aspects of this that are beneficial. Um, but these numbers are also based on garbage. We get paid whenever we produce garbage. Our GDP grows up whenever we create pollution and we clean it up. Whenever people have horrible diseases like cancer and diabetes and more people are in the hospitals, it's good for our GDP. Whenever we there's more war, we sell more guns, it's good for our gross domestic product. Whenever we have more people um, in emergency rooms and more people in prison, we make money. And that's the bottom line, is that because we are measuring our success based on these indicators, that we are, we are continuing to push for this way of developing. And yet it's all of these things that are negative for our human and our environmental health. And so posing this question, are economic systems the only way to measure the well-being of our society and integrity of the natural systems we depend on? Well, you're in this class, so I know you know it's not. And we have two more ways that are really essential for measuring our well-being. And uh, in the chat, what do you think these other two circles are? So we have economic systems. Health systems. Other guesses? food systems, cultural systems, planetary systems, social systems. Excellent. Every single one of these would fall into these categories. And the, the broader categories we're using in this case, ecological systems and social systems. Um, and health would fall into that. Um, cultural would fall into would fall into that aspect. And so we need to think about these these three broad systems, not just our bottom line economic systems, but the triple bottom line. So these are the three circles that changed my life whenever that presenter came to my class. And that's because I was a really passionate environmental activist at that age. And I kind of just thought all economics sucked um, and humans just sucked because we were destroying the planet and destroying each other. And all that mattered was, um, was our environment and that we stopped making less of an impact on it. But this gave me a broader perspective. It helped me realize that all is important, that yes, we need to measure the success of our economics because meeting our needs as human beings is important. And that just because we have been destructive to the earth or to each other does not mean that 
we are cold hearted or we deserve the destruction. It, it just means that we need to learn and we need to learn how to love ourselves as humanity better and to be better in better partnership with our earth as a whole. And so this gives a more complete perspective. And what we're looking to do is find the sweet spot in the middle between these three systems. Um, and so in the center of this Venn diagram, and right now, this is kind of like sustainability today. It's the age of green-ish products. So we're trying. We're trying to bridge the gap between these three systems. So what's in here? What are some examples of sustainability today? What are the things that we're trying to do um, in the age of green-ish products to create more overlap between our environment, our society, and our economics? Drop it in the chat. What are some strategies that we're trying here? Recycling, solar energy, yep. Upcycling, so reusing things. So we could just recycle the materials into something else, but if we can upcycle it, it takes even less energy and effort to turn it into something else. All right, I'm not seeing anything else come up in the chat, so we'll call that good because um, we'll talk about any more. And so going to a tangible example, designing, has been designing physical products with environment and society in mind. Yep, using approaches like circular economy, life cycle analysis, human-centered design. Uh, Shay, it's funny that you mentioned reusable products like bags. I have an example in here that relates to that. Um, and then what's left out? You know, as we're thinking about these these things that you're talking about, recycling, solar energy, upcycling, what are we missing? Um, and I'm curious if people have some insights on this. What do you, what's missing in the sustainability movement today? What are we not not doing well enough, or what do we need to think about as well as? Um, and I'll give you an example. Nice, Christina, changing legislation. Great. Um, and I'm going to touch more on that here. So more social sustainability page. Yeah, like equity. sometimes we're getting so caught up in, okay, how do we shift the environment that we're forgetting some of the most um, under the most marginalized or unprivileged as, uh, people in our communities. Uh, unity and optimism, Nicolette. I really like that insight because yeah, so much of this movement around sustainability is like, is the world is ending, climate change is happening, uh, it's going so fast, we don't know if we can do anything about it, uh, the world is ending, it's, and there's not enough unity and optimism, I'm so with you in that. Um, more cultural change through by rethinking things, for example, how we design our bathrooms, just like that, that, uh, that permaculture farm that I was at, they're literally taking their waste turning it into biogas, using it to run their kitchen. Some people in our culture here would be like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> um, no, that just, we just flush that down the toilet. It goes away. We don't think about it, right? But we need to start thinking about how we use those things. Um, and then an example that I want to share when recycling. So great, we're better at recycling. And I spent a lot of my years creating recycling programs at my school, at other schools, but then the janitors, people would separate out the recycling, but then the janitors would throw it all in one bin. Okay, we start to improve that. Um, and we're recycling more now, but what have we been doing with our recycling? A lot of it has been going to other countries. Um, and question mark, have they not? Now a lot of those countries like China started turning away a lot of our recycling. It started ending up on the beaches of Philippines and is not always actually being recycled. Um, and so what can we do besides just recycle and, and ship out our problems? We need to really be thinking about what's happening and maybe even going further back to when that product is made, which this touches on the circular economy, when that product, product is made, it's called cradle to cradle, thinking about where it's going to go after that instead of people, companies designing products just to go into the landfill. So those are some of the things that we are leaving out and you all are sharing some great examples. Um, 
supporting locally owned businesses instead of large organizations, redistribution of wealth. Um, <laughs> yeah, Christina, they're, they're trying to. Um, <laughs> yep, and I have heard things like sending it to space, which would not be ideal, that stuff will come back to get us in some way or shape or form. Um, so just to share a little example of, um, of sustainability today in terms of light bulbs, as an example. So for a long time, we had these incandescent bulbs, um, these fluorescent, I think it's been so long since I even thought about these other light bulbs because a lot of people are shifting towards the LED bulb. And that's great. Um, in today's world of sustainability, the LED bulb goes right here in the center. Um, but you can hear about these longer lasting light bulbs that were built back in the day, um, back in the early 1900s when they were first being invented. And now today, light bulbs don't seem to last nearly as long. And so while we're saying, okay, cool, let's use more of these LED light bulbs, we need to understand and dig deeper into the system that decided to create planned obsolescence, to make it so that um, so that light bulbs don't last as long uh, because they need people to drive our economics. They need people to keep going back and buying more light bulbs. There was actually a coalition of people back in the day that came together and said, okay, we need to create not longer lasting light bulbs, shorter lasting light bulbs for our economics. So people keep coming back and buying them. And they've been kind of like the light bulb mafia for a long time. And now today we still see those practices of planned obsolescence used by companies when it comes to our cell phones and our technology. So we need to break down those systems, not just keep pasting on the next new technology as a solution to sustainability. And what we're trying to do is get more overlap. We're trying to create integrated systems, maybe by the year 2050. Um, and so we're trying to think about, rethink that light bulb, but also rethink how it's powered. And yes, maybe we want more wind and solar, but in producing that wind and solar right now, a lot of the tools and technology we have to do that still uses a lot of fossil fuels or uses a lot of mining to get these materials. So it's not all just create, you know, run and create these new technologies. We need to slow down and think them through. I'm going for nested systems. So here, our economic system is the center circle. It's nestled within, it's based on the needs of human beings of our social system, which is based on the needs of our environmental system. So we're thinking about our ecology first and living within the bounds of nature's principles. Nested system, so to speak. And as you can see, this is a long-term goal. We're thinking out to 2100, so we're not gonna get there tomorrow, um, but we are becoming part of the change today. And so this is some example, kind of the high tech example of nested systems. We've got the LED light bulbs, we've got the smart meters on our houses, we have the solar and the wind, we're designing our buildings to have taller windows and more natural lighting, we're going to EV vehicles. And eh, part of the challenge with this is like, okay, there's a huge movement in sustainability just to shift to all electric vehicles. What is it going to take to shift to all electric vehicles? A massive amount of manufacturing, tons of mining, what it takes to mine like the lithium for the batteries or many of the, the heavy, intense heavy metals that make up these cars. Um, we have to slow down and think through and kind of shift our lifestyle, not transfer what runs our cars. And so we really need to break down many systems. I'm gonna hop through this quickly because I wanna get to the meat of the matter here. Our, our um, renewable energy systems, zero waste, the circular economy, we actually touched on a lot of these systems already. So I'm just gonna pop through water systems, food systems, transportation, um, green building, um, really thinking about living building systems, buildings that produce more energy than they utilize. Um, like this building, the Bullet Center, which is on Capitol Hill in Seattle. And um, thinking about living cities, and what does that look like? As well as equity being a key question we're asking across all of these systems. And understanding that it's not as simple as this diagram, right? This, If this beat was the world, we have all of these different global interactions and cultural contexts to work within from 
um, America to China to the European Union to India and South Africa and Japan and Korea and Singapore and all of these different players and many more. It's one big Petri dish and it's our experiment. And while yes, it's discouraging and disheartening at times, it's also exciting. We are on the cutting edge, that's opportunity. All these challenges are opportunities to create solutions. And all of you are very passionate and have a lot that you can contribute to these creating these solutions. And so let's talk sustainability. It means meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In some ways, what this meaning and what the movement has become about has become sustaining our current needs. But our current needs are not sustainable. And so we need to think differently. We need to think like um, what Albert Einstein said. If I had a problem to solve in just one hour and it was terribly difficult and my life depended upon it, I would spend the first 55 minutes framing the problem. So that's why we spent so much time at the beginning just going into what are the challenges, what are the systems, and why as you develop your visions, you want to spend a lot of time getting to know what's already out there, not just jumping in with your new idea, who's already doing things along those lines. We don't always have to recreate the wheel to create systems change. How to create systems change is actually finding something that's working and then helping to replicate it and to, to bring it broader. Uh, to have a repeat slide there, repeat slide. And so what we want to go for beyond just sustaining our current needs, there's a whole movement of people beginning to say sustainability, it's cool, let's keep doing it, but it's not enough. We need to go deeper. We need to think regeneration or regenerative sustainability. And that means going beyond reducing harm, actively seeking to restore and revitalize natural systems through innovative and restorative processes. The easiest example to think of with this is with our food system. Okay, yes, let's buy organic, let's use less pesticides um, and less harmful chemicals, but that's not enough um, because a lot of organic food that is just using less pesticides and harmful chemicals isn't thinking about building soil. And so regenerative agriculture says, no, we need not only need to use less of those things, but we need to figure out how to build our soil because building soil sequesters carbon. Building soil creates more nutrients in the soil, which means more nutrients in the food, which makes the food healthier for people. Much of our food today is becoming less and less nutritious partly because our soil is becoming less and less nutritious. Um, and so, and we can look at examples of regeneration across all these different systems that we've talked about. And so why is this important? Well, because we have, um, if we follow this purple line here on this graph, um, we've come down to degeneration. We've made a lot of intense environmental and societal changes and impacts that have led us to today. And if we just sustain from here, we're sustaining from, from a low quality place. We need to regenerate. We need to uplift from where we are today so we can create a new balance and we can create resilience in our systems. Um, and so, get out of my annotate here. Going backwards, going forwards. And so what that looks like is building from the conventional you can see on the left and thinking more than green and thinking more than sustainable, which is in the middle, but thinking restorative and regenerative. Um, so let's make this personal. What does that look like in terms of clothing? Um, if we're talking about just individual impact, uh, some of you mentioned this already. Instead of doing fast fashion and, and the all of the uh, marketing that's been developed to get people to buy new clothes, um, which if you have to sometimes do your thing, but if we're thinking to be more regenerative, we want clothing that's designed maybe in the, in the middle, sustainability is like low impact. It's designed based on, it's thinking about sustainability initiatives and redesigning the um, thinking about where its materials are coming from. But even better is secondhand. There's so many clothes out there that exist that um, could be just reutilized. And that's very minimal impact to reutilize those clothing. Well, on the waste continuum, 
from moving from garbage and landfill on the left to, hey, we could recycle, that's awesome, but also better than recycling, let's just reduce our waste in the first place. Um, and let's go towards, hey, even zero waste. But zero waste is cool, but how can we just like lower our impact in general um, and live um, more minimally, more in alignment with nature? And then the food continuum, which I, um, and so how thinking about cool organic school, it's kind of over there on the left just before non-organic, but we want to go even more like regenerative. Okay, regenerative is cool, but can it come from your community? Or hey, can it come from even your backyard? Um, and then if we're thinking in a broader systemic sense, um, some examples of that, of the restorative. So we're looking on the right here and at the top, net positive energy. So producing more energy than we need, carbon healthy materials that are better, um, that circular economy, cradle to cradle. I think you all get the point. So I'm gonna keep moving forward. We're looking at our spirituality, our economy, our society, our mother earth, our culture, our politics, and really shifting that in terms of regenerative development. Um, and so we need people who are thinking about business success and economic success you see on the left and how to make it mutually enforcing with the regeneration of people and the regeneration of the planet. And so a lot of people are taking this as, okay, I start a social business and I help achieve our social or environmental goals. And what I want to help you all do today is think that, think about how to do that, but then also think about how to play bigger. How to not just be a social business founder, but how to be a systems change leader. Um, and these slides, these couple slides are actually from a great TED talk uh, called Reclaiming Social Entrepreneurship by Daniela. Um, and uh, she really goes into detail about the difference between these two things and describes how um, a kind of a social purpose founder is is kind of hoodwinked by the business sector to think, okay, I just need to create a small business and then grow it to a big business. But being a systems change maker is much more complicated than that. It's really thinking about, okay, I might have a business, whether it's small or big, that's a part of this picture, but how do I create connections between all the different small circles, big circles that are, are um, working together to solve this problem? And so to give you an example, uh, bags made of reusable materials, someone mentioned. Um, these are bags that are made from reclaimed fire hose. And firefighters decommission tons of fire hose and then they end up in the landfill. I had never thought about where do fire hoses go uh, before I learned about this example. But the co-founder of a company that makes these bags, her name's Cressy, she figured out how to sell enough bags, belts, and wallets to reclaim the entire supply from London's fire brigade each year. Um, and then they donate their profits back to the firefighters charity. It sounds pretty great, right? But that's only one aspect of the system. It kind of fails to change that system of, of waste to begin with. It's just making kind of an economic opportunity within that. And it is saving those materials from the landfill. But her goal is a lot more than that. So instead of just focusing on selling more bags, she's not only running her business, but she's collaborating with local governments to improve their waste policies. She co She's collaborating with businesses to rethink their products so that they're thinking from cradle to cradle, how do we recreate this? Um, and I want to give an example of someone really thinking about systems change. And then I'll share with you my personal example of thinking about systems change. And this is where I'm gonna get into some of the nitty gritty of those, those tools that I mentioned. Um, and so this is Sustainability Ambassadors, our leadership team. And we started working with student leaders. We had um, a team of 43, really up to 50 at one point, ambassadors across nine different school districts, the private school network, all focusing on how do we drive sustainability across our community. Um, and we taught them these four skills, and these are the leadership skills needed to drive systems change. So I encourage you to write these down. Policy analysis, understanding the policies in our communities, understanding uh, performance assessment, how 
are we doing against the policies? Where are the policies getting in the way? And where are the gaps in our communities so that we can, through project management, understand how to make an impact? And your projects might be just a little project or it might be a whole organization or it might be an initiative that you're driving, but you still need the skills of project management, tracking and managing goals against the performance um, in order to advance our policies or, or shift our policies to ask for more. And then public speaking, the ability to speak powerfully about what you're doing, um, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with people or it's to a group of people, you need that ability to speak. So policy analysis, performance assessment, project management, and public speaking. The four skills that you, leadership skills you need to help drive systems change. So we were teaching students these skills and then as an organization, we really begin to think about uh, collective impact. There's a consulting firm in Seattle that tracked across many different organizations and um, collective change work. They said, what are the key principles needed to drive collective impact? And they came up with these five principles. Common agenda, shared vision, a common goal, just like this whole crowd of people is in this rally because they really want to shift um, to send a message. They have a common goal of the message they want to send to their political leaders. Shared measurement systems. We need shared ways of really tracking um, how we're going to do this. Mutually reinforcing actions. We need um, different people playing their different roles. And then continuous communication. Um, continually reporting what we're doing, what we're working on, learning from other people, finding who's doing what, um, so we can know where we need to move the needle forward. And then a backbone. We need um, organizations, individuals, people that are really helping to connect the dots and ensuring that this continuous communication is happening. People know what actions they need to be taking. We're tracking the numbers towards our common goal. And so for example, take an orchestra. An orchestra's common agenda is to play beautiful music. And they have the shared measurement systems of how they're keeping in time and in tune with the music. They have their mutually reinforcing actions of different instruments playing at different times. And they're constantly communicating um, through the conductor at the front who is the backbone kind of holding it all together. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. And so how we were doing this as an organization is uh, not only working with students, but then working with teachers, finding the teachers who are already passionate about sustainability and getting them to redesign their curriculum. So it was more hands-on, more problem-based, and then they would implement it into their classroom. And then they would advocate that to their school district to get district-wide adoption. So now one passionate teacher impacting their classroom of students now could impact the whole school district in terms of what they were teaching. And we didn't stop there. We were we were not just thinking about educators and students, which you see in the graph at the top, but we were thinking about community leaders. So in this case, water systems as an example and get and connecting with who are the water managers in our communities and how can students and teachers begin to help solve the problems that they're looking on, that they're working on. Therefore driving collective impact across all of these different groups. So social entrepreneurship Creating whatever, if you decide to create a business or a nonprofit or work in the government, it's not really about working in one of these isolated silos. But if you want to drive systems change, you need to figure out how to work across all of these different systems and build connections between them. <clears throat> um, and so I'm getting uh, pretty much at my time. Um, and so I'm curious. Uh, if um, I need to pause right on time or if there's a few extra minutes that could be had. Um, so if you could let me know. Um, yeah, if you're willing to stay on for a couple minutes, um, we would love to have you. Okay, excellent. Um, what I wanted to do was a, a discussion at one point, but I think I'll just have you all put it in the chat instead since it's limited timing. Um, and then I'll just leave you with the last thing, which is the five steps to birth your vision. Um, and so in the chat, many of you listed the things that you're passionate about or areas that of emphasis, and maybe that's the areas that you want to create change. But um, if you could in the chat now, what is an area that you want to create change in? And are there ways that after hearing all of that, you're now thinking more deeply 
about it. You're now thinking, um, and take a moment if you need to. Um, I'll wait 30 seconds to a minute before reading some off. Take a moment to really think this through of where are you wanting to, what's the issue that you're wanting to drive change in, the system that you're wanting to change, and are there strategies that are coming to mind of how you could um, change it in a deeper way through your mission, through your vision? And I know it's a deep question, so I don't expect it to be easy. So Paige, you're mentioning systems of comfort and rest. Um, I really love that you brought that up because that's a, when we talk about um, regeneration being kind of the next level to sustainability, that's one aspect of regeneration is like, how do you regenerate? Well, you got to slow down. You got to take time to kind of let your nervous system settle so you can understand how to create change to a new way of living. And if we just keep speeding up, speeding up, then we're, we're constantly acting from that place of intensity and continuing to create more of what we don't want. Um, I love that thinking about what backbone might mean for your work or your organization. That's great because we have so many great organizations out here um, doing this different type of work. And, um, and they but sometimes there's not a backbone really ensuring that 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 change is staying consistent. Sterling, I love your your extended response. So you want to create change in food systems and make things more real in a way. Um, running a bakery that keeps things closer to what is naturally given, growing your own crops for for baking, yes, it can be a massive undertaking. Um, or is a massive interest. Oh, nice. So growing your own crops for the baking. Um, and then, you know, if you're thinking about how to be a system change maker, you're creating the model, you're doing it. And then you can be sharing that back with your community, with the people that eat with you and say, you know, this is what I'm doing to contribute to this, this problem. And what are you doing? And it becomes this positive peer pressure back to other people. And you could use that as positive peer pressure back to you, um, back to your local government saying, hey, this is what I'm doing through my business, through my bakery. Um, what are you all doing? Here's some things that you can do. Christina talking about how there's people who want change, but we're not being listened to by our government, by some of our government system that really doesn't want to change. Governments are big and clunky, um, and there's a lot of people in power that don't want things to shift. Um, and a lot of people don't even know. And so bringing awareness being the key and empowering people to have the confidence to speak up. And I think sometimes so and that's so important because sometimes people are so disempowered by the fact that their government won't listen to them that they don't actually take they don't realize that there's actions they could be taking to change their own life yes the government gets in the way at times and yes we can make a bigger shift if we can get the government to help shift but a majority of the times that policies have been shifted it's because people shifted first and then the policy shifted second and the policy helped get more people on board. But usually it's a group of people that started off that say, no, this has to change. And they make the change whether or not policy is on their side, whether or not the government is on their side. Nice, Shay. So how can we just make less food get thrown away rather than just giving it to the homeless? Sure, if it's left over, let's give it to homeless people. But Let's think from the beginning, how can we change our practices? Uh, I love seeing the ways that you all are thinking deeply about these issues um, and wish I had some more time for questions or insights. Um, and I'm happy to stay as long as you all are, but I don't want to take up time for your lecture. So I'm just going to share with or your next part of your time. So I'm just going to share with you strategies to birth your vision. 
Um, and there's some depth here that I won't have time to go into, but if you are left with really just these five key things, then it will help. I love acronyms, you'll see. Uh, birth, so if you're birthing your vision, you wanna start with build, you wanna build it. What is it? Thinking it through. Impact, start creating an impact as soon as you can. Um, you build it, get out there and start taking action on it. As you're doing that, build relationships with people who are already doing that or who you can serve um, and grow your impact in that way. And by doing those things, you can build trust. And there's other things you can do to, to if you want to keep creating change, you need to build trust with those relationships through your impact, um, through the vision that you've built. And then you need to get help along the way. No systems change maker ever does it in isolation. Um, driving collective change is not something you can do by yourself. Um, you know, we'll often hold up these big change makers like Martin Luther King Jr. and other other people, other heroes of change. Well, they're amazing. They did not do it alone. They did not do it in isolation. They had a big movement of people helping them. So who is your movement of people that you need to find? Um, and so this, maybe I can send it just as an image that you all have because you won't necessarily have time to go into all of these, but just to show that um, uh, I'm noticing trust and tools are different here, but that underneath each of these, there's key things you can do when you're talking about building. Um, it's building your, your brand. What's your message? What's your underlying structure? Are you a business? Are you a nonprofit? Are you an initiative that gets other businesses and nonprofits together? Who's your audience? One of the most key things to think about is like, who are they and what are they struggling with? How can you help them um, help those systems? What are the leadership skills you need? Those four Ps we talked about and discipline is so key to building whatever it is you're going to build. Um, results. Um, and so think about your revenue. How are you evaluating your success, your evaluation? How are you developing success stories, uplifting um, those things that are making the best impact? Um, leveraging your success stories, leveraging um, your connections to make more change so you can build trust and create a system. Um, once you kind of launch your vision, you're starting to get results, you wanna figure out how you can systematize your impact, whatever change you're making. Uh, tools, thinking about technology, organization, process, your action plan, and having a clear strategy. Uh, there's a lot here, and I know I'm going fast, but I just want to leave you really with those, those kind of, with the big picture here, and help as soon as you can. Hire people that have the that whatever your weakness is. Get other people to that are strong in that. Do it so you can focus on your strengths, um, and then educate and empower other people along the way. And developing partnerships. So the world is your oyster. Um, create the change you wish to see, you can do it. Whether you do it by starting a nonprofit or a business or you do it by plugging into some of the existing systems, it doesn't matter. You can be a change maker. You can be a social entrepreneur without necessarily starting something new, but by really seeing this broader system, finding the gaps and plugging in where you can get the most success.